everyone, my name is Kelly Moran and welcome to the third segment of our 2021 virtual event series during the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute Tech Testing Expedition. We are about halfway through the season and these events are opportunities to hear about the excitement of all of our expeditions, preview the stories coming to you from sea, meet and engage with inspiring team members from OET's core of exploration and learn about the science, technology, engineering, and history that excite everyone that we talk with. Uh, we're really glad to have you all joining through Facebook and YouTube. You're able to send in comments and questions uh, through each of those platforms. So please now tell us where everyone's joining from, but throughout this entire program, please send us your questions about uh, everything we're talking about and to our presenters. Uh, we're a few days into a very exciting, but also a different expedition on Nautilus, uh, where we're testing new concepts of operations, working with autonomous vehicles and remotely operated vehicles together to push forward the cutting edge boundary of what's possible in ocean exploration. If you've been following along on nautiluslive.org, you know we have a lot of new underwater vehicles and equipment on the deck, uh, and you can learn about each one of these new robots and programs on our homepage at nautiluslive.org. So some of the teammates have stepped out of their really busy uh, day today and part of their expedition schedule to hop on here and talk with us and dig a little bit deeper looking at these various tools and capabilities especially with one of the vehicles on board right now, which is a hybrid AUV ROV uh, called Nereid Under Ice or NUI. So let's go live to EV Nautilus right now and introduce our first presenter, Mike Chakuba, who is the technical lead for NUI on this expedition. Good morning, Mike. How's it going on EV Nautilus this morning? Good morning, it's going great. Very busy, but we're doing well. Perfect, great. Uh, big picture. This expedition is about coordinating these autonomous vehicles and remotely operated vehicles to work together more efficiently um, and just to really tech test them out and see how they're working uh, in the underwater environment. And one of the key tests has been controlling Nui as an ROV, uh, but without a tether connected like a typical ROV. Uh, can you explain a bit about this and really just how it works? Sure, yeah, we've been trialing control of the vehicle over a so-called free space optical link. So basically we're sending light into the water and receiving it on the other end and in both directions. And it's acting like a virtual tether, but without any physical connection between the two vehicles. Um, and so what that allows us to do is switch very fluidly between operating the vehicle like an AUV and operating the vehicle like an ROV. Um, but it does have a limited amount of throughput. So it's not as, um, goods that say transmitting video, for example, as a hard tether, physical tether would be. Um, so we're relying more on the autonomy that's on board the vehicle to manage that connection. So for example, if the connection goes out temporarily, the vehicle sort of keeps itself safe and waits for operators to reconnect with it and tell it what to do next or to go back to piloting. That sounds super interesting and something that, you know, a lot of people are familiar with are ROVs that are connected to the ship. So how did the idea of Nui come to be to, you know, have a hybrid that's not actually connected to a ship that in the traditional manner? Sure. Well, actually, so that goes back to a pretty different use case and not actually involving the free space optical comms. Um, so it's called Nereid Under Ice, and the under ice is key to the way the vehicle has come to be. So um, what we we're trying to do overall with the vehicle, or originally anyway, was to provide the same kind of capability that you get with a hardwired ROV uh, in open water, but except under ice. And so one of the major challenges there is that if you're working in sea ice, uh, the sea ice moves, uh, but the seafloor doesn't. So you've got to accommodate the fact that the vehicle and the ship are gonna uh, separate from one another over time as you're working on the seafloor. And the, the key piece of enabling technology is a unarmored light fiber optic tether, about uh, just three times the thickness of a human hair that connects the ship to the vehicle. And there's uh, 40 kilometers of that in the system. So, and that translates to about 10 kilometers of separation that can happen between the vehicle and the ship uh, while it's working on the sea floor. But that tether doesn't transmit any appreciable electrical power. So we can't run the vehicle like we would a traditional ROV with a, with a hard copper wire to it. Um, we get only the communications part, only the part that goes through the fiber on a normal ROV. So that means the vehicle has to carry its own batteries. 
It has to have its own computer aboard in case that tether breaks. So it's got to handle switching between uh, an AUV and an ROV sort of potentially by accident instantaneously without any interaction from operators. Um, <clears throat> so the hybridism is sort of driven by that need to operate under ice and to deal with this, uh, with the pecul peculiarities, if you will, of this, of this very fine uh, tether system. But what it means is that we end up with a hybrid vehicle that we can use um, pretty effectively for technology demonstrators like technology demonstrations like this, because the vehicle has all the autonomy built in on board. It has all the infrastructure to switch between these different modes. Um, and if the tethering becomes something like the free space optical modem instead of the, uh, the light fiber, then we're pretty well set up to handle, again, those transitions between the different ways of operating the vehicle. Awesome. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we're not under ice right now, we're off the coast of California, but what are some of the challenges you had mentioned? It really has everything that it would need with it, but what are some of the challenges you might encounter bringing a hybrid ROV to a new ship like Nautilus or to other vessels as you're tech testing and trying out this system? Yeah, uh, so ship integration is a challenge with any vehicle. Um, and every time we are operate on a new ship, it's a, uh, a big process to get all the bits and pieces in place, uh, you know, in terms of where things go on the deck, how it's going to go over the side, integration with ship, ship systems, like, for example, the ship's navigation system is a key part of this. Um, so that's, a, again, the case with all, all vehicles and all ships. I think with, with Nui, there are some additional challenges because it operates like an AUV and an ROV at the same time. Uh, I can switch between the two again. Uh, so we've got, in some sense, like all the complexity of operating an AUV plus all the complexity of operating an ROV, and we have a reliance on acoustic communications to again accommodate potential loss of the of the high bandwidth connection to the vehicle. So we have that part that needs to go on there. So that physically means things like, well, we need a place to put our transducer over the side, and we need to integrate with the ship's navigation systems, subsea navigation systems, and we need to integrate with the with the ship's uh, surface navigation systems to know where it is, so we can plot the location of the two elements relative to one another. Um, and, uh, and we just have a lot of stuff actually, and you'll see some pictures of that later. And again, that's because the vehicle has all these different, uh, modes of operating. And so we need a place to put all those things and we need a way to access them cleanly when we, um, you know, do physical work on the vehicle, either to repair things or for example, to arrange the, the work basket. And you'll, again, you'll see uh, more of that soon. So we've worked pretty hard to make that, um, that mobilization process as efficient as possible but it definitely is a challenge finding space for everything and, and tying it all down and make sure it can withstand, uh, you know, bad weather if we get it. Absolutely. And, you know, we're a few days in, uh, big question. How's it going so far? Are you testing the way you were hoping to? Um, and is everything kind of going as planned in this uh, tech test? Yeah, well, in so much as no plan survives contact with the enemy, it's going great. Uh, we've We've actually pushed a little bit into some of our stretch goals, uh, which is which is fantastic. Uh, so we've checked off all the sort of key items that we wanted to check off at this at the conclusion of this portion of the cruise. Um, we've demonstrated the vehicle operating in this hybrid modality, switching between mapping and being piloted, uh, actually sending up those maps in real time. That's worked great, and we've had really good success with the optical modem. Um, but you know, of course, there have been some. Uh, some problems as well. I mean, some of this, it's a technology demonstrator, right? So we've got kind of two two categories of problems. Ha problems that are uh, just happen, things things fail over time, everything gets used, the, the ocean is a difficult environment to work in, um, and problems related to the technology we're actually trying to demonstrate. So the latter are problems that we fully expected. We've built in time in the schedules for debugging and so forth, and we've been making good progress, I think, on all of those. And like I said, I've checked off a number of things at this point. Um, the other kinds of problems, those that just happened from using the vehicle, we had a good one yesterday. Uh, we had the hydraulic power unit fail subsea, um, and that ended the dive a little bit prematurely, about an hour earlier than planned. Um, and we had to come up to the surface with the doors open on the front of the vehicle, which meant that it was a little bit more challenging to recover, but things went fine. Um, and, you know, we have the spares on board to deal with this. Again, we have a lot of stuff with us, so um, we've since diagnosed what happened and replaced, uh, 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 rebuilt the motor that failed and that's being replaced on the vehicle as we speak. 
Awesome. Well, I'm really happy to hear that even after a little incident yesterday, you got it back and uh, made it a bit more difficult to retrieve. And that's a really good segue to go to our next presenter. Uh, so we're going to hop on actually over outside on EV Nautilus and talk with Casey Machado, who is the lead pilot for Nui and has been piloting Nui this week on EV Nautilus. Hi, Casey. Hi, how's it going? Good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, can you kind of give us an overview of uh, Nui and talk about uh, this super cool robot and just kind of show us about uh, what is there and what are you working with? Yeah, of course. So welcome to the back deck of Nautilus. This is where all the magic happens, so to speak. Behind me is the Nereid Under Ice uh, vehicle herself, Nui, as uh, we like to call her. And uh, this cruise is all about different types of communication with Nui. Um, and so the first half of this cruise, we have uh, been using what's called an optical modem, an optical link. And so that is a piece of equipment that uh, I can show you right up here. Um, we have a, a, a transmitter and a receiver here, these glass domes, they will blink light up um, to uh, Argus, which goes way above uh, Nui, just sort of watching from an aerial view and be able to receive those blinks of light back down. So we can have a wireless communication with the vehicle. And that's been really cool. And it's enabled us to do a whole bunch of different things. It gives you sort of freedom from the ship and the ability to uh, basically uh, do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do if you were hard tethered. And so the second half of this cruise is using another different type of communication uh, technology and connection. And this one is using a, uh, a, a winch and what we call a hybrid tether. And so this big yellow uh, tether that you see that they just hung the, uh, the shiv and the shackles and all of that up there for is going to connect up to the top of Nui here. And that will give us a, uh, a full bandwidth fiber connection to the vehicle. So that's uh, really fast and gives us the ability to do both, uh, you know, high definition video and real time control without any sort of latency. And the neat thing about this is this yellow section of the cable is very strong. It's strong enough to lift uh, near it under ice out of the water. We'll be coming in through this A-frame here. Uh, but it's also the top half of that cable is a very thin, small uh, steel cable, which wouldn't be able to do that. So what we're doing is we're taking a small cable, connecting it to a uh, much larger cable that's much stronger. And then we're able to basically get uh, get enough force to lift Nereid under ice out of the water. Um, so this is the uh, this is the front end of the vehicle. You can see uh, the star of the show is uh, the manipulator arm here. And you may have heard uh, in other broadcasts, we've been talking a lot about uh, autonomous manipulation and all of that. And so on the end of this is a fisheye camera that uh, basically lets Nui and the arm see all of uh, all of the seafloor underneath. And it can create basically a, a 3D reconstruction of that and uh, allows Nui to autonomously see where it's going. And so the rest of this workspace you can see has a bunch of uh, what are called fiducials. These are uh, basically optical tags that go on the vehicle itself and allow these two cameras up here, there's two stereo cameras up here alongside our um, our high definition camera, which you'll hopefully be seeing some gorgeous views of tomorrow, um, basically create all of this space you see in front of you in, uh, in a 3D world, in a digital world that then could allow us to send that back home and allow people on shore to participate much more actively and much more interactively with what we're doing here. Awesome, thank you for that great overview uh, of Nui. And you're standing, you know, kind of in the perfect spot for really showing off some of the tools that uh, you've been using. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing this week, um, testing out the different equipment and different tools that are um, on Nui. Have you been using that manipulator arm a lot? Uh, and are you, you know, taking any samples? Kind of, what are you just doing um, during these testing with all of those different tools? Yeah. So, um, in terms of uh, tooling, we have we had the optical modems I showed you back there, which are the communications link. But then we also have all of the stuff that we inter interact with the seafloor with, and so. Um, 
everything's kind of pulled apart a bit uh, because of the uh, hydra, uh, the HPU, the hydraulic power unit here, you can see there is a whole part of that missing right here, which is uh, what got pulled off. Um, it's getting worked on. But normally, uh, something like this lives in the tool tray. Um, these are what's called the push cores. They take sediment samples uh, of the seafloor. So you basically insert them down into the ground and uh, you'll get your sediment that fills up uh, inside them. And you can see these ones are specially equipped with those same uh, April tags, those fiducials. And uh, that lets uh, these cameras basically autonomously find where this tool is and grab it and uh, put it in. So you're going to see a lot more of these probably in the next two dives as we do all that uh, autonomous manipulation. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience asking, does Nui require Argus, the ROV Argus, uh, to dive or can Nui go in the water without any other robots around? So uh, Argus, which is uh, over here, it's been kind of uh, tucked away uh, just past the team here. So you can see Argus back here. Um, normally we don't interact with Argus and that's one of the, uh, the neat new things that we've done on Nautilus is we've actually set up a program in which uh, both Nui and Argus uh, interact together. So before this cruise, these two robots have never met, uh, but we got tremendous value of having Argus. So the uh, other optical modems were mounted on the back of Argus there, and they're kind of a matching pair to what was on Nui. And so what we did is we had Argus above uh, getting these gorgeous sort of aerial shots of Nui, and then that was our communications link uh, between the two. Great, But Thank we you. normally operate completely free swimming. Okay, awesome. That's really good to know. And um, it also kind of leads to another question. Um, someone is asking, are we getting the live transmissions from the seafloor from Nui? So can our viewers at home go to Nautilus Live and watch what's happening as it's happening? Uh, yeah, we actually have a very, uh, very expansive amount of live content that is uh, coming back. You can see both uh, the operators in the control room doing things as well as video feeds from the vehicle. And what's exciting about this next uh, next portion of this with this winch and all of these uh all of this uh, cable. So in here, there's a, a strength member and a bunch of fiber optic cables. And so uh, through the fiber, we can send full high high definition video back up. So the pictures tomorrow and uh, the day after should be should be pretty remarkable. And we found a very cool site yesterday, which uh, had some bacterial mat and some seeps uh, through it. So you should see some pretty compelling views of the seafloor in glorious high definition. Perfect. Can't wait to watch. Uh, Another viewer is asking, can Nui take push core samples all on its own? So, you know, with the manipulator armor, with all the different scientific tools on her, is she able to, you know, do it all by herself? Yeah, so that's kind of the goal of this whole cruise, right? Is uh, right now as a pilot, I can go through and, uh, you know, command the arm to pick up the push cores and go. But when you're playing with all of these different speeds of communication, it can be, it can be difficult. We have sort of dropouts in control. And so in order to kind of combat those difficulties, we need uh, autonomous help. We need sort of a co-autonomy. Basically, the smarts and autonomy from Nui is helping me as the pilot is if the connection uh, drops out, Nui says, okay, Casey, I've got your back. I can help do this. And so I can engage one of those autonomous modes and uh, move and take a push core. Uh, right now, uh, Nui needs my help as much as I need Nui's help in piloting. Um, but in the future, and this is where all of this technology is probably going to evolve into in the next few years, is that we will be able to send Nui down autonomously and it will, uh, with almost no human interaction, be able to drive this manipulator arm over, pick up a tool in the basket, move it, take a sample, uh, and bring it back. And the other cool thing is it may even be able to take input from, say, a scientist that's thousands of miles away on another coast uh, at a different institution, um, and that scientist can say, hey, this is the thing I'm interested in, and then Nui will autonomously figure out all of the things it needs to do. And so one of the, the, the intricacies of that is if you're picking up a push core, I, as a, a, a human pilot, know that I don't, I don't bring the push core out and hit anything on my way out. But uh, as a robot, Nui doesn't necessarily know that until you have all these cameras there. And so there's a, a great path planning um, algorithm that goes into all of this. So Nui can not only maneuver the tools around, but do so in a safe manner. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Casey. Uh, if you want to stick around, we'll come back with more audience questions in a little bit. But I am going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Zach Berkowitz. So hi, Zach. How are you? Not too bad. Perfect. Um, so a little bit different from our last two presenters. Uh, you're not on EV Nautilus. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've been involved in this expedition and uh, what you're doing with uh, Nui? Sure. So I'm also an engineer here at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, basically right across the hall from Mike when he's here in the office. I work primarily with a different vehicle, and I was brought in to try to be the shoreside support for this kind of technology demonstration. So at least personally for me, it's been a great learning experience because I get to play around with another vehicle. But what I've been doing is as the shoreside component of this, uh, setting up some of the equivalent systems that they have on the ship there so that when we try these remote checkouts and remote capabilities we have kind of a mini version of those or a very small version actually of those command center shots that you see coming from the ship we've got a couple computers here a couple screens uh, all running the software or a subset of the software that they have out there at sea and using the link from here to the ship and then through Argus and then through that optical modem all the way down to Nui on the seafloor, uh, we were able to demonstrate some basic things like driving the uh, vehicle around from here, moving the manipulator from here. And, you know, we were able to demonstrate that capability works and we were also able to, you know, dig up some issues that we figured we'd have in terms of late latency, but also kind of expanding upon about what does that actually mean as someone that's trying to control Nui remotely? You know it's going to be a bit laggy, but what does that mean to the operator that's actually controlling it? You know, does it matter how much of an impediment to actual the actual use is? So my role has been as much kind of a technological poking and prodding as it has been kind of a human poking and prodding and what it what it, what it's like to actually do some of this stuff remotely. And you have your downs with just like anything with testing. Um, but really, how has it been like sitting in your office and not actually being on the ship, you know, with Nui while you're doing this, uh, you're across the country. Uh, it, do you, are you having a hard time being not, you know, right there? Or is this, you know, being where you are um, and doing it all remotely? Is that helping you figure things out in terms of like what to do next for the next uh, expedition, you know, with Nui on another vessel? Sure. I mean, I mean, to not really answer the question, it, it's both good and bad. It's, it's quieter here than on the ship. Uh, it, it's, 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 again, it's, it's, it's difficult in the sense that um, all of us that go to sea are basically used to working in a bubble. You know, you go out, Mike, talked earlier about going out to sea with a bunch of stuff. And that extends also to the human element. You bring a lot of expertise with you. You'll bring a lot of people who are good at mechanical stuff. A lot of people are good at electrical stuff. A lot of people are good with software stuff. Because usually when you're on one of these cruises, you are there with your group. And you're both kind of the first, second, and third line of problem solving. And if you actually have to reach out to shore, it's almost at a last resort because you've you've kind of run out of ideas or in this case when you set up with a dedicated shore support um, it's more about managing information flow and when you're not used to being able to reach out quickly or coordinate it's it's that's almost something that we're we're figuring out as well so it's it's less it's, it's less of a technological thing as more of kind of just a human component um, but yeah, it, the, the, the separation does introduce its own technological challenges, some of which we're going to be trying to um, kind of poke at a bit with one of our tech demonstrations coming up here in the next day where we'll have what's called this augmented reality hollow lens where I should be able to see what an engineer on the ship is looking at and try to help diagnose problems with uh, in real time as opposed to what we do now, which is a bunch of emails, which may or may not get off the ship, depending on how good the internet is. 
We do have a um, question from a viewer asking, what is the latency like? Do you have a delay between Nui and what you're receiving? Uh, and if so, do you see that, you know, being resolved or fixed in the foreseeable future? Oh, sure. I'm sure it'll get better. Right now, the quickest turnaround time is about a second to maybe a second and a half. And that's purely for, say, me typing on a computer here, a keyboard here, and having it talk to the computers on Nui. Uh, when we were trying some of the arm manipulation activities the other day, uh, the pathway was a lot longer, a lot more convoluted, and the round trip that I was seeing between issuing an ARM command and then watching it on the screen of my computer through one of the video feeds was up to about five or six seconds. And you can imagine as you're trying to control something like, like a hand to pick something up, if your brain is trying to move something but you don't see anything for five seconds, you, you can get confused pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's a, a great way to put it. And I hope everyone watching just really understands what is happening. You know, we have a team on board uh, working with the systems, but then we also have uh, you and other folks who are on on shore working with it. And it's, you know, Massachusetts to California. So it's it's a big, big jump across the country. Uh, so kudos to you for uh, working with Nui from where you are. Uh, I'm going to actually have a question for you and then I'll jump over to Casey. Uh, Mike's already answered this next question during a previous uh, video that we did, but um, we do like to ask all of our presenters, how did you get to doing what you're doing? Um, you know, what kind of was your pathway to being there at Woods Hole and um, now working with Nui and other uh, tools in ocean exploration. So uh, Zach, sure. we'll start with you since you're on screen, um, but kind of what was your path? Uh, so I grew up a few towns over from Woods Hole, so they've always kind of been in my backyard. And I've always had an interest in kind of science and technology, a little bit of robotics, but that kind of showed up a bit later. And I kind of figured out that if I wanted to do this kind of stuff. I still want to be close to the ocean because I grew up next to the ocean. Uh, so marine robotics seemed like a great way to poke around in electronics and robotics, but not kind of end up landlocked in an environment that I didn't really want to be stuck in. So that's the broad stroke of how I ended up here. I, I bounced around a bit. I, I was on the West Coast for a while. I was overseas for a while. Then I ended up maybe 20 minutes away from where I grew up. It's kind of a nice circle though to, you know, come back and be back home at work where you've always kind of seen from your, from not so far away from your house. Casey, I'm going to pass over to you and ask you the same exact question if you're still out there. Uh, I'd love to know more about you and kind of how you got to where you are working and piloting uh, Nui and other robots. Yeah, so um, I am a mechanical engineer uh, by degree and by trade, and I, I would say that my interest in robotics and engineering got started uh, at a pretty young age. Uh, my mom likes to tell the story of me going into the garage and literally just taking everything and anything I could find apart. Uh, I wasn't as good at putting things back together um, back in the day, but hopefully, uh, hopefully Nui is evidence that I've gotten better in that, uh, in that regard and uh, making usable things. But uh, my interest in all of this comes from just challenging design uh, problems in engineering. Uh, how do you put robots in places that are incredibly difficult for anything else to go? And the bottom of the ocean is probably one of the most challenging environments on Earth. And it presents a whole set of really unique and rewarding challenges to solve from an engineering perspective. And so like, uh, like Zach, I actually uh, grew up on Cape Cod, a couple towns away uh, from Woods Hole. And it was sort of during my, uh, during my college years that I would uh, come back in the summer and I actually got an internship uh, at Woods Hole and the rest, as they say, is sort of history in terms of my career path. I've been at Hui for about 15 years now. Um, and so it's, uh, it's kept my interest and captivated it. And I mean, if you look at just this, uh, just this cruise alone, the pace at which we're doing innovative engineering things is absolutely staggering. I, we were talking about this earlier with uh, some of the team in that uh, this is 
by far the busiest cruise that we've ever been on. And we're just going, oh, we've never done this before. Check. Okay, we tried that. Never done this before. Check and tried that. And so that is what keeps me motivated and keeps me excited about my work. Awesome. Great answer. And just excited for you to be out there and uh, learning what you're learning, but also piloting Nui and uh, just being on EV Nautilus. So thank you. Uh, Mike, I have one last question for you. And then where it looks like we're running short on time, but Mike, I want to toss it over to you um, and just ask as the technical lead for Nui and uh, this expedition, um, one of our viewers is asking what types of people uh, are involved in doing this? You know, like what kind of backgrounds do students or educators or uh, just anyone interested in piloting Nui or working on Nui, uh, what kind of background do they need to be there and do it? I think mostly they need to be willing to work hard, but um, but I, you know it's really all of the above. So definitely electrical, mechanical, software; those are all elements of this vehicle. Uh, being hybrid or being an AUV means a lot of software components. We have this sort of specialty sort of disciplines in in fiber optics expertise because when we're using the light fiber, in fact, we're using fiber on uh, uh, the yellow tether you saw. It's just inside instead of by itself. Um, and acoustics is very helpful too. Not necessarily fundamental acoustics knowledge, but you know, understanding kind of the basics of of what makes that system work and, and doesn't, and then how to use the particular hardware that that we have. Um, so, so I think there's there's room really for any uh, technical skill, um, in especially with this vehicle because it does really span the spectrum. Uh, there are a lot of soft skills involved too. So not everyone is um, well suited, let's say, to go to sea. It's close quarters. Uh, it's the same people. You know, we always joke about uh, getting flights to and from and asking our, our travel people to make sure that we are not sitting next to each other. Um, you know, but on but, but once we're on the boat, of course, we are, are all are working tightly as a team. And it's important to have the right kind of personality for that and the willingness to work. You know, what has been 16 to 18 hours a day since since we arrived, both during Moab and now during the cruise itself. Um, this is a fairly short cruise, so that's maybe a little easier than it would be on something like a 50 day. But um, but those are all, uh, you know, you sort of have to have to have the right personality for that. Um, and then there's kind of a managing the overall project. Right. So trying to keep a, a perspective on what the overall goals are at the same time as you're trying to figure out why one particular component is not working. So being able to manage that transition between the very detail oriented and the big picture is a uh, is another challenge. Next, we're getting some help from shore on that one too, and that's that's also facilitated by this uh, high bandwidth link we have between between the ship and onshore. Uh, so some of our our uh, more senior PIs are able to, to kind of make sure we're we're keeping the big picture in mind. Great, uh, and I know everyone has a busy day ahead. Um, so thank you, Mike, Casey, and Zach for taking time out of your busy day and part of this expedition. Uh, to hop on here and chat with me and also to all of our viewers who are watching and learning a bit more about today's expedition and what's coming up ahead. So thank you all. Um, and our thanks also go out to the NOAA Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute for their partnership to bring the Ocean Exploration Trust and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, teams together for this expedition. It's been really fun watching the dive so far and uh, will be for the next few days uh, tether dives with Nui begin tomorrow morning and later today on the live stream. And you'll be able to see Nui practicing some launch and recovering operations uh, with this test tether soon. Uh, this series will continue throughout the entire 2021 exploration season with expeditions on EV Nautilus currently off the coast of California, but bringing, bringing you on adventures. Uh, from the East and Central Pacific. And you can share this channel with your friends and your family uh, so they can follow along and keep exploring with us at nautiluslive.org. And you can join us for the rest of the week uh, on our website to watch all of the tech testing happening uh, for this expedition. It's been great so far. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you tune in to nautiluslive.org uh, in the next few days. Thanks. <laughs>